Chromio, Chromio, wherefore art thou, Chromio? Well, that's an easy question. Thou art here, at the top of group 6. Like most of the other transition metals, chromium forms a wide variety of coloured salts, hence the Greek word chroma in its name. Chromium can adopt a wide range of oxidation states, but its two most common are plus 3 and plus 6. Though they're typically green in solution, CR3 plus impurities in sapphire crystals turn them into beautiful red rubies. But in their yellow plus 6 oxidation states, chromium ions turn into daffodil coloured cancer marbles. Chromium-6 salts are rare in nature, but they are often synthesized in industry as dyes and primers for anti-corrosive paints. Unfortunately, if you breathe them in, chromium-6 salts will invite themselves in and turn the cells lining your nose and throat into lumpy carcinogenic porridge. The chromate ion, one of the most common plus 6 chromium ions, is a genotoxic carcinogen, which means it causes cancer by irreversibly reacting with DNA inside your cells. Chromate ions share many chemical and structural properties with sulfate and phosphate ions, which are essential nutrients in all living organisms. If chromate ions are inhaled, they'll sneak into your cells through the same chemical pathways reserved for sulfate ions, sort of like a miniature great white shark flopping its way into an orphanage through the cat flap. Labourers in steel mills and tanneries that undergo repeated exposure to chromate salts are at risk of developing a whole singing dancing orchestra of health problems with their respiratory systems. Asthma if you're lucky, lung, nasal and paranasal sinus cancer if you're not. But even if you have a nice cushy desk job and work remotely five days a week from an insulated plastic terrarium, you can still get a nasty dose of chromate poisoning in your food and drinking water. If you're from Bangladesh, you might have heard of the Bodhiganga River, which runs through the capital city of Dhaka. You might have also heard it's one of the most heavily polluted rivers in the world, and that swimming in it is about as good an idea as taking out a cell barge for the Indian national cricket team. When the restorative rainstorm of the monsoon season come to an end, the putrid waters of the Buriganga turn pitch black. Wherever you go along the riverbank, raw sewage, dead animals and plastic waste bob along its waters like unusually smelly rubber duckies. The death of the Buriganga was one of a thousand paper cuts. Having one of the most densely populated cities on earth use it as a communal latrine for centuries didn't help, but the deepest and nastiest cuts were inflicted upon it by the garment industry. Next to China, Bangladesh is the second largest export of clothes and fabric in the world, thanks to, shall we say, flexible legislation regarding sweatshops and child labour. There are thousands of garment factories in Bangladesh, but if you want the waste products to get really nasty, you have to look towards leather tanneries. Chromium-3 sulfate is used as a tanning agent in the production of leather from animal skins. Leather produced this way is stretchy and resistant to shrinking when wet, making it ideal for the production of jackets and handbags. Unfortunately, when you dry it, the chromium in the leather has a nasty habit of undergoing oxidation to carcinogenic chromium. Chromium 6. With poor ventilation, little to no protective clothing, and a complete absence of health and safety procedure, tens of thousands of workers were killed or suffered debilitating injuries by the negligence of both their employers and the state. In 2010, there were over 200 tanneries in Dhaka alone, and thanks to lax environmental regulation, they were allowed to spend decades dumping untreated chromate waste straight into the Buriganga. But even Bangladeshis living hundreds of miles from Dhaka weren't safe from the insidious bruise of Poo Lagoon. When a sheet of animal skin is converted into leather, the waste bits of fat and connective tissue are often shipped off for processing and converted into protein-rich chicken feed. Problem is, the chromium compounds used in the tanning process don't go away, so if you feed your chickens on Uncle Billy's carcinogen, Energetic skin pellets, the chromium-6 will be carried up the food chain to your customers. A 2013 study estimated that 25% of all chickens in Bangladesh contained harmful levels of chromium-6 in their livers. The study recommended a ban on the production of animal feed from tanneries, but with the depressing caveat that such a ban would be nearly impossible to enforce in countries like Bangladesh because of how profitable it is for farmers to use cheap, toxic feed. In 2017, the government spent at least 10 billion taka to move all tanneries from the banks of the Buriganga to a new industrial estate in Sava. But while some progress has been made in preventing further pollution of the river, many tanneries are still dependent on processing companies located by the Buriganga, and law enforcement has been slow to crack down on small businesses illegally dumping waste products into the waters. But hey, what are they going to do? Not dump toxic chemicals into the water? Next, I suppose you'll want better labour laws and chicken burgers that don't give you stomach cancer, Stalinist. One of the most iconic uses of chromium compounds is chrome plating. By placing a metal in a chromium salt solution and passing an electric current through it, you can magically coat it with a shiny layer of chromium, fit for only the snootiest of robot art galleries. After World War II, chrome plating was used on everything from cutlery to jewellery to handguns, but nowhere was its use more iconic than in the automotive industry. In the 1960s, chrome plating was something of a status symbol. Bumpers, rims, even door handles were drenched in chrome. But as time moved on and tastes changed, chunky chrome grills fell out of fashion in favour of sleek, modern designs. The sort of car Batman would drive if he was a gaming mouse with dead parents. Opinions are mixed on why chrome bumpers are 
rarer than they used to be. Cost is almost certainly a factor. Car manufacturers looking to save a few quid will skimp out on electroplated metal in favour of chrome-coated plastic. Definitely cheaper, but it'll dull more quickly and be chipped to buggery by stone, sand and schoolchildren. Practicality is also a factor, particularly for motorbikes, where an ill-timed glare from the sun can send you hurtling towards the shadow realm at 200 miles an hour. And for some people, it just looks a bit gaudy. Plaster dipping has become a bit of a trend in the modding scene, where you coat over the shiny metal bits of your car with darker matte plastic. Yeah, that's right, your truck gets to stay up until 10pm and watch 15 rated films, without asking a grown-up. Now, as a latte-drinking, low-tea, cat-ear-wearing non-driver, I don't know, I kind of like chrome. I think if it's done right, it can look quite nice, and I do hope it comes back into fashion in future. Although, given current trends in car design, maybe we should coat everything in chrome like that one episode of Spongebob and hope we all suffocate to death before things get any worse. Chromium was discovered by Louis Nicola Vocola in 1797, who also appears in my episode on beryllium, an element he would discover in 1798. Please be kind, I was still using Windows Movie Maker back then. In the 1790s, Vocolan was investigating the chemical properties of lead ores from Eastern Europe. One that particularly caught his eye was a strange red mineral recovered from a coal mine in Siberia, known to Vocolan as Siberian red lead, but it's now more commonly known as crocoite, a mineral largely consisting of lead 2 chromate. After extracting all the lead from the mineral, Vocolan discovered an element in the remaining mixture that produced an array of highly chromatic compounds. Yeah, I can't imagine that took long to name. Vocolan had discovered two elements by the age of 35, but he didn't spend the rest of his career resting on his laurels. By the time of his death in 1829, Vocolan had published over 370 scientific papers, discovered a suite of compounds in organic chemistry, including the first amino acid, asparagine, in 1806, and had been elected to some of the most prestigious scientific institutions in the Western world. Not a bad legacy for a mineral that looks like an alien hedgehog that's been mainlining Robinson's summer fruit squash. So that's chromium done. We're officially 20.339% uh, through the periodic table. Not a bad effort for three and a half years, should get that up to a nice round 50 before the end of the century. Despite its prominence in the thumbnail, I didn't get to talk about Google Chrome or how all of Google's products have the capacity for privacy of a fishnet nappy, but element 24 will ride the highways of the chemical world forevermore, shiny and chrome towards the gates of Valhalla. Now witness me for an extra 70 seconds. I'm about to enter the last stretch of my PhD. Grad students do not make much money. You see this line? That's the Welsh minimum wage. My stipend does not match this. Now, I live within my means. I tutor, I take on extra demonstrating and marking work, but despite all of the time and energy I put into my videos, I've never really tried to make money from them, largely because I assumed no one would care and I'd look a bit silly if I tried. Unfortunately, studies have shown that pessimism is Reddit and cringe, so I've taken the plunge and started a Patreon. A lot of students and academics watch my videos, and I know you guys are as penniless as I am, so I deliberately made my Patreon as cheap and accessible as I can. For $2, you get your name in the credits of all my videos. For $5, you get a little headshot that I'll stick in the credits. No NSFW though, my mum watches these things. For $10, I'll draw you a coloured headshot. And for more, I'll do other cool stuff, I don't know. Being able to make money from drawing, the thing that used to get me in trouble when I wasn't paying attention in school, is my lifelong dream. So if you want to take pity on a poor grad student, every donation, no matter how small, is deeply appreciated. Right, I that's enough from me. Show the new credits.